This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. In the last lecture, we saw some of the cyber risks which can exist, some of the problems with computer security. And now we come to look uh, a little bit more at how we can counter some of these risks. And cybersecurity, uh, the managing of risks, uh, really involves, first of all, identifying where there might be problems, where there are vulnerabilities, uh, take action to protect against those risks, uh, monitor and detect, uh, and then take action to, to, ma to, to, to minimize any problems. So how can we identify risks? Well, one of the ways you can identify risks is to keep a record of what's gone wrong, have people uh, reporting uh, uh, well, when there was a, a problem with something uh, to do with IT. But apart from that, you can have independent reviews. These could be carried out either internally or externally. Externally, uh, for example, you can hire what are called white hat hackers. Uh, these are individuals who are very skilled at uh, hacking into computer systems. And, uh, but instead of doing this for uh, malicious purposes, they are doing it to test whether or not your system it has weaknesses uh, that, that, that more malicious hackers, if you like, uh, could also make use of. You need to uh, protect against uh, any vulnerabilities you uh, suspect or have discovered. So access controls, you make sure that there was proper uh, you know, password management and authentication. Uh, encrypt uh, data as it's being uh, transferred uh, around networks. Uh, you would have antivirus checkers, you would have firewalls, you would have physical controls like uh, making sure the, uh, the file server was uh, locked away uh, uh, so, so that people couldn't simply physically steal uh, the uh, computer with all that valuable information on it. You may even have rules about people uh, eating at their desk in case, uh, or drinking at their desk in case there's a, you know, a, a risk that you know, coffee has spilt over a, uh, an important uh, piece of machinery. Make sure that you have backups taken regularly, so that something bad does happen, uh, you haven't lost everything. Make sure there are resilient networks, uh, so that if uh, one or two machines for some reason go down, uh, other machines will continue working or you can bring on stream perhaps some additional processing and staff training. Staff training is, is, is important uh, because uh, you know you have to train staff that you mustn't go and download stuff from the internet. Uh, you must train staff that they uh, mustn't write their password on a post-it note and put it on their screens uh, and, and, and so on. Uh, you must train staff to make sure they regularly go to the bother, perhaps, of taking backups. Uh, so uh, you must train staff not to to talk to people uh, about, uh, you know, their, their passwords. You know, I use my children's name for my password. It is not very good for security. Detect potential breaches. <clears throat> you know, uh, sometimes you you try to get onto a site. You haven't been there for a while. Uh, you put in a password is wrong, password is wrong, password is wrong, and quite often after three times, uh, uh, your account is frozen. Uh, <clears throat> now that is, that is basically detecting potential breaches. Uh, and when you've got it wrong three times, then you have to, to, to take some sort of action to unblock it, phone them up, or they send you a special message on your phone or a different email address, uh, uh, and that it then has to be acted on. You no longer have to type something in uh, to release your account again. But you can also look at network traffic. You can look at the flows of information around the place. So if you suddenly discover an awful lot of information is flowing from the server to one particular user's machine, and maybe it's happening at a peculiar time of day, maybe it's happening at kind of 10 o'clock in the evening, uh, when you don't really expect anyone to be in the office, then you're just thinking, why is that information flowing to this person's machine? And of course, it might be flowing there because they are essentially stealing that machine, putting it onto a USB drive, 
uh, and selling it to the highest bidder. And then we have disaster recovery plans. If something bad does happen, you know, something big and bad does happen, uh, what are our recovery plans? Disaster planning, disaster recovery planning is important. It's important was first realized uh, back in, I suppose, the 80s, 1980s, uh, when there was an IRA campaign and a couple of large car bombs went off in the city of London. Uh, and many office blocks, and in particular the computer systems, uh, were damaged. It was recognised uh, again uh, in the 9-11 in the Twin Towers. Those buildings were simply stuffed with financial companies. But by that time, uh, lessons had been learned, uh, and most of those companies had backup systems in place and disaster recovery places uh, systems in place and although there was huge loss of life in, in terms of data and in terms of uh, continuity of supplying services there wasn't a great interruption most of them were back and able to be operating within a week uh, because what many of them had was parallel systems they had their main system perhaps in Manhattan but then they had a parallel system you know across the river in New Jersey or West Coast, something of that type. And when one computer system was destroyed, the other one kind of switched in automatically. Really important in something like banks, really important in airlines, travel agents, anywhere where you're actually, the, the actual business of selling and providing the service depends on continuity of the IT processing. So that's your standby procedures, recovery procedures. Personnel management is important. Remember, if there is some sort of disaster, uh, people will be affected. People will be nervous. In some cases, people may be absent because of injury. Uh, and so what we need to do is to make sure everybody knows what their role is uh, and, and also what the prioritization is in terms of an emergency. So define responsibilities, assess the risks. Uh, so certain systems must be kept going. Other systems, well, we can live for two weeks without getting that system back. That's prioritization. Stand by backup arrangements, communicate with staff and communicate with customers and the press. Uh, there is a, a danger, of course, that if people hear about a disaster, they think this company will not be functioning again. I'll send my orders somewhere else. And it's important to reassure stakeholders that everything is well. Business continuity planning and uh, hardware duplication. Uh, how are we going to make sure that there's minimal interruption uh, should one of these disasters happen? I mentioned briefly here, there's more in the text, but, it, but it's, a, it's a bit tedious to read, frankly. ISO 2000. Uh, uh, 701, that'd be one, 27,001. It's an international standard for IC sec uh, IT security. Uh, there are 14 categories and 114 controls mentioned in this. Uh, you will not be required, I don't think, to, to know all of these uh, 114 controls. Uh, it's just, I think, more you'd be required to have an idea of uh, the sort of things it, it looks at. So three out of the 14 categories it covers here, human resources. Would you have thought uh, that it was important uh, to have background checks? So you're going to employ a programmer. Uh, the programmer is responsible for really important bits of uh, coding, uh, you know, taking customer data, taking their credit cards and so on. Quite obviously, if, if that programmer was dishonest, they could make all sorts of backdoors and so on. So background checks into the person's competence and really their criminal record uh, and, you know, how they got on in their past employment is pretty important. Disciplinary procedures. You've told somebody you mustn't download from the internet and they do. Well, 
Maybe the way to stop that is to give them a warning. Maybe in extreme circumstances the way to do it is to sack them. Access control, I think we know about. Password management systems. Uh, these are systems which say, you know, after three months your password is now out of date, you have to choose another one. And it, it stops you choosing, if you like, an old one from, from two times ago. Frankly, I find them a bit irritating, uh, because if your password has to change very frequently, how are you going to remember it? And of course, the temptation is you begin writing down your passwords uh, and so on. But at least have a management system which says it has to be at least eight digits, at least one has to be alphabetical, and at least one has to be a special character, like, you know, an exclamation mark or a dollar sign or something of that type. It stops people just putting in one, two, three, four, five, uh, if you insist on that. Communication security. Uh, how are we going to protect information in transit? Are we bothering to encrypt it? And so on. What about non-disclosure agreements? So non-disclosure agreements, uh, you know, programmers change jobs. Uh, what you don't want is a programmer leaving your company, joining another company, uh, and maybe taking some of your valuable methods of processing with that person. Think how uniquely good Google is at finding information for you on the internet. Somebody knows, you know, the algorithms that Google uses so that if I type in a search term, it's very, very good at pinpointing sites I'm interested in. I find it better than other search engines. Now that is, is a, in a way, a closely guarded secret by Google. And you don't want a Google employee going and, and you know, uh, spreading the secrets around. Cybersecurity tools and techniques. Uh, forensic analysis. Forensic analysis. So when you hear the word forensic, think of a court. Uh, and one of the tools and techniques is if something has gone wrong, uh, then you may well want to prosecute someone for that. Prosecute someone for illegally accessing your system or illegally changing data in your system or uh, maybe putting a back door in the system if the person is a programmer. What forensic analysis does is that it analyzes the system in a very secure way so it can be used for court evidence. So for example in the UK if the police were to you steal your computer at home because they suspect you've been hacking into the Pentagon or something, they don't take it away and just turn it on. Because as soon as you turn it on, you begin changing the files. And as soon as you begin changing the files in a way you've interfered with evidence, uh, so what they do is they take it away and they'll take your hard drive out and they put it in a special machine which only reads uh, so that the latest activity recorded on your hard disk uh, is not in any way changed or amended uh, and it, it is downloaded if you like in its pure form in a way that can be used for evidence. Malware analysis. Uh, you find a virus. One of the things people try to do is to work backwards to see uh, how is it made? What does it do? Uh, when you find a virus it's going to be a series of basically ones and zeros. It's going to be in what's called object code. It makes no sense really by looking at that. You have to kind of reverse engineer it, so to speak, to see, well, this is what it looks like in the computer, but this is what it looked like when somebody wrote it, and this is what it does, so you really understand it. And then you can uh, set up counter measures against it, or you can more easily identify it. Penetration testing, we've kind of talked about that already. This is your white hat hacker. How easy is it for uh, your bad people to get into your uh, system? And then there is uh, software uh, security. How are we going to protect software against attack and amendment? Uh, we know that if you change software, you're changing the results coming out. 
if you change software, you are maybe getting the software to, to send off information to a third party uh, that is, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't be going to. It's often tiered. Software is often you know, really critical software down to, to less important software. But an example of really important software is the software used by clearing banks. So kind of every day, uh, what they're doing is they're moving money around. So it used to be done by checks. Now it's done more often through internet. How do you know if you type in, you're trying to make a payment, you're typing in a sort code, you're typing in an account number or where you want the money to go to, how do you know that the money you are releasing from your account is reliably going to the account number you wanted to go to. And obviously, if, if somebody interfered with that kind of chain of events, you know, in a worst case scenario, they could be funneling all these payments into their own account. So one of the things that the uh, uh, banks do is almost before they, they, they kind of turn on their systems, uh, is they have a very secure copy of the software. This is kept separate. It's not connected to the internet. It's almost as though it's kept in a, in a bank vault. This is the master copy of the software that they know as works. They know it is secure. And they copy, and then they compare the working copy of the software against it. So this is what we're going to use. We compare it against this master copy, uh, and if, the, if there's some sort of disparity between it, you know, this has been changed in some way. Uh, and before they begin to use that software, they will investigate what that change is, because the software might be too dangerous to take a chance on otherwise. Computer general controls, uh, computer general controls uh, are policies and procedures which relate really to the computer environment. So the data center and network operations, a data center, lock it away. Uh, have you know, badges which give you physical access control. Network operations with uh, uh, passwords, and everyone has a password. Uh, all logons are going to be recorded and so on. It doesn't matter what you're doing on the computer, this, this kind of security system is going to be in place. We have to be careful with our software. We must make sure we buy the right stuff. We must make sure it is changed and amended and tested properly before we adopt new software. We have to make sure that uh, the application system, the wages and salaries, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, accounting system and so on, we have to make sure that whenever we are buying software that we go through some proper procurement uh, process to make sure we buy software which is going to work on our machines, to make sure we buy software which is going to be fit for purpose, that it's going to be usable by our business. There's no point in buying software which just works in one currency uh, if you are working in multiple currencies. So there needs to be a, a kind of procurement policy for all software to, to make sure that somebody has decided on it properly rather than a, a kind of almost random purchase. Access security we've talked about, disaster recovery we've talked about. I, again, it's affecting all the software, all the processes which are taking place. Application controls. Application controls are controls which uh, are to do with particular applications, specific controls to do with wages and salaries, specific controls to do with, uh, you know, putting a new customer onto the receivables ledger and setting their, their, their credit limit and, and, and so on. So once we get down to specific bits of processing, you're talking about an application, you talk about an application control. So again, you need access controls. Uh, you have to make sure that uh, if you have uh, the receivables ledger, there are access controls to the credit limits. Uh, if you ha have wages and salaries, you must make sure there are specific access controls to uh, people who can change the salaries. And they might be quite different to the access controls 
uh, from uh, the, uh, the people who you know, type in your overtime hours or quite different from the access controls uh, for people who can change your address and, and so on. We can use passwords, we can use fingerprint, we can use voice recognition to make sure that the authorized person is making the changes. And then we have integrity controls. How do we know that the, the data being put in and updated to files is correct? So again, passwords can, can come in, but you can have a range of controls. Uh, for example, check digits. We've talked about this already a little bit uh, when we're looking at how do we make sure that data wasn't corrupted. You know, we said if you wanted to put in the uh, number, uh, let me just get my pen working. Uh, if you want to put in the number, you know, 164, then it'd be a check digit like, say, 5, so that the, the action number was easily and evenly divisible by 13. A very simple kind of check digit. So you can do this on somebody's, you know, employee number. So their employee number might be 125, very simple employee number. Uh, and so what you would do is to say, right, that's your employee number. How do we know we type in 125 and not 126? Uh, well, again, there'd be a check digit there, 5, so that the employee number would never be 125. It would always really be 130. And again, evenly divisible by, by 13. So something special about the employee number, the part number, the customer number, which will identify problems. You've come across this, almost certainly. Almost certainly you've come across trying to type in a credit card number and immediately it comes back and says not valid. It hasn't gone unchecked with your bank. It's, you know, it's immediate return. And there's something special about your way your credit card number is constructed that it will recognize that it is not valid. A range test. If you're putting in dates, you know that the, the day should be 1 to 31. A dependency check is slightly more uh, sophisticated. Uh, that would tie up maybe the, the days you put in with the month. So nothing wrong with putting in 31. Nothing wrong with putting in a uh, month of 5. But if you put in days 31 and month of 2, the two pieces of data together are incompatible. There's a dependence here which isn't working correctly. Format checks. And again, you've seen that. Uh, you know that if you put in your credit card number, I think you have to put in four lots of four numbers. I think it's a 16-digit number or something of that type. Uh, so everything you put in is supposed to be a particular format, a phone number, uh, a postal code, a zip code. Uh, they all come in standard formats and we can easily check that that has been uh, uh, adhered to. Sequence checks. Uh, sequence checks, uh, you know, invoices issued in sequence. Uh, the system can easily identify that the sequence is incomplete or that you've tried putting in the same invoice twice. Matching. Uh, so if you have a dispatch note on file, you need to make sure that at some point there's an invoice on file. If people are putting in their timesheets or their clock cards, you need a timesheet for each person. Uh, and if there's a timesheet missing, then you go after that person and say, where is it? That's matching input data to something on file. Control totals. If you're putting in three invoices, what you can do is, first of all, you know, add them up. So here we have 5, 6, 7, 10, 4, 5, 6, 7, 70, I think it comes to. That's your control total. You put that in first, and if somebody mistypes, uh, and let's say they think that, that 3 is another 5, and they put in 15, it's obviously not going to reconcile. Uh, and Control totals, batch totals, were, you know, a very powerful way of uh, trying to control uh, completeness and accuracy of the data being put in. And then we have systems development controls, which we've talked about. If you're changing the wages and salaries program, make sure 
that it's changed for legitimate purposes, that it complies, let's say, with the new tax rules, that it is properly tested, that it is reliable, and only after authorization of the changes, checking of the changes, testing of the changes, will you allow that to be adopted as the new uh, working piece of software. Reporting uh, cyber risk, large organizations nowadays uh, have a section in their annual report dealing with all sorts of risks. And cyber risks is just one, one, one subcategory of overall risks. And what you want them to do is to go through and say, we've thought about these risks. Uh, so if you're an airline, you know, one of the risks is that the booking system goes down and nobody can, can, can do anything. Uh, another risk is you put in the wrong fare. Uh, another risk is that you can't check people in because that's not working. You can't issue the boarding cards uh, and so on. You, you would identify all of these risks. You would say, here's its effect and here's what we're doing about it. Uh, or here's what we can do should the worst come to the worst, the machine breaks down. Here's our fallback position that we have at least considered that. You'll see some examples in the notes. Finally, uh, big data. We'll go through this very quickly because you'll have seen it before in other papers. These are extremely large sets of data, usually very historical in nature, maybe going back five years. Uh, and what we do is you analyze this data, hoping to find useful patterns, useful insights uh, into particularly customers or potential customers' behavior. The characteristics of big data, uh, it, people talk about the three Vs, uh, great variety, great velocity, great volume. Uh, so typically supermarkets uh, do this, they, they, uh, uh, the volume of data they hold, every branch of the supermarket, every checkout, uh, they will be recording what's bought and who's buying it. So enormous volumes of data. It happens very, very quickly coming from, you know, thousands of input devices in the country. And increasingly, it's of great variety. It's not just, you know, what you bought, when you bought it, how many units you bought, what the price was. Uh, it will be also recording where in the supermarket that item had been stored, which kind of shelf it was on. Increasingly, they will begin to be uh, identifying you not by your loyalty card, but by facial recognition systems. They will be tracking you as you move around the store. They will know if you've hesitated uh, in you know, f front of a, uh, you know, a particular shelf, looking probably uh, at a particular item that you decided maybe not to buy. But now they know that next time, maybe with a little bit of encouragement, you might buy it. So uh, that's just in, in supermarkets. But if you think in... Uh, in terms of your mobile phone. What do you have in your mobile phone? You have the people you rang, you have conversations, you have photographs, and you have geographical information. Mobile phone companies know exactly where you have been with your mobile phone, even if you're not using it at the time. Uh, and you've probably been irritated, uh, actually, when you visit a shop. Nowadays, you get a little message uh, coming up saying, how was your visit to Sainsbury's or whatever it was? Uh, or even nowadays, if you walk past the door, it picks you up and says, you know, how was your visit to Sainsbury's? And there's, there's no way of kind of saying, I didn't visit it. Uh, I find it slightly eerie uh, and slightly annoying. Um, I must find some way of switching it off. So we've got here uh, examples of the volume here. We didn't go through here. We have mobile phones and so on here, here where you've been and so on. If you look at uh, your activity on the internet, it knows every page you've looked at, every product you've clicked on, how long you've spent in a page, where your mouse has kind of hovered over, even if it doesn't click. They know the next site you visit. They know where you were when you access that site, physically where you were and so on, it's absolutely huge. Think of, and of course, the controversial elements of Facebook, how much they know about you, where you've been, who your friends are, what your preferences are, what you like, 
uh, and, and, and so on. And of course, this is, we know it's valuable. We know this is how Facebook and Google make their money. It's because this information that is collected under the form of big data is then marketable, that can then be uh, uh, sold to advertisers uh, to try to entice you into taking up their offers. Great variety, we didn't go through all of this in great uh, detail, but buying habits, geographical information uh, and so on there. Uh, Facebook, of course, can now uh, tag, identifies people in your photographs and it tags them with their identity, even though you haven't told Facebook uh, who they are. We have financial transactions. Think of information your credit card knows about your purchasing preferences and the like. Big data, big data analytics, data mining. This is the idea. You go through this vast mound of data. Lots of it's going to be rubbish, really, not very interesting, as, as you would if you're going through looking for gold. But every now and again, they come up with this little nugget, this little gem of information, uh, which they can uh, use to increase their profits. Predictive analysis. <clears throat> uh, here they're trying to say, well, next week, uh, the weather is predicted to be good. Uh, last time the weather was predicted to be good, sales went up. Uh, they're bringing together, you know, information from a number of different sources. Uh, and so the predictive anal analytics would allow them to say, well, the weather's going to be good next week. There's probably going to be more barbecues or more demand for cold drinks. Uh, let's, let's order some more of those in. It'll also predict what special offers you might be susceptible to from your previous buying patterns. Text analytics, voice analytics, uh, it, it will understand what you say. It'll understand what you write. Controversy now about uh, things like Amazon Echoes, that you know, the little, the little kind of cylinder that can sit and you can say, uh, uh to the, Anyway, Alexa, what is the weather in Paris? And it will come back, the weather in Paris is. Uh, but it's listening all the time. Be careful what you say. Statistical analytics, looking at trends, correlations, patterns, unusual events, and so on. Uh, again, primarily to do in, in business, primarily to do with marketing uh, and uh, trying to get that marginal revenue up a little bit. Finally, remember there are cyber risks with big data. It will cost a lot to establish these very large databases and to process them. We have to make sure that we don't embark on big data where the benefits are less than the cost. Increasingly, this huge amount of personal information is uh, subject to laws. Uh, and if the data protection laws are breached, there can be very substantial fines uh, levied by the authorities. Loss and theft of big data is likely to irritate you know, your customers, is liable to uh, lead to a, you know, a, a loss of reputation. It may come in for a fine, of course, itself. It may lead to actual loss if credit card numbers uh, are uh, disclosed in, in, in some way, and then compensation payments have to be made. Veracity means how do we know the data is correct? Uh, if you have incorrect data which gets into your big data database and then you begin making decisions based on incorrect data, those decisions are going to be wrong and potentially going to be expensive. And finally, we have the potential of employee monitoring. Um, employees now are monitored quite a uh, quite a bit. For example, in, in Amazon, uh, just very recently, there was a report saying that in the Amazon warehouses, they were monitoring how efficiently their employees worked, how many boxes they managed to pack it, to package in a day, how long it took them to, to do a box and so on. And they ranked the employees and the ones they reckoned uh, were not performing adequately uh, were sacked. 
So uh, this this encroachment, if you like, on I suppose personal liberty uh, is something which many people are concerned about.